everyone. Welcome to Mediumship by Picasso. My name is Picasso Roberts. I really appreciate you stopping by my YouTube channel. I have something to share with you today from my own experience, from my own life experience, and uh, in dealing with the subject matter that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'll say right up front, I'm not a doctor. I don't diagnose. What I initially wanted to do today was... Um, a book review basically on a book that really helped me out while I was going through this particular experience uh, with my m mother before she passed um, however when I started searching online for the book that I wanted to share with you guys it's not available anymore so that's a that's just that's a bummer because it really really helped me so the book that i was trying to <laughs> that i wanted to do the review on uh, is called the jewel in the condition this is a new perspective on alzheimer's it was written by uh, a lady in a group that i was in uh, back in the mm, right around 2005 2006 um cindy collins sparkman uh, she's a really really nice lady and i remember when she wrote this book and uh i i didn't read it straight away i didn't read i held on to it and just didn't read it i bought it because i wanted to support and i i didn't read it until i actually had to deal with the subject matter which is Alzheimer's. So I know that a lot of people are dealing with Alzheimer's uh, either directly because they have a spouse or a partner that is has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, or they have Alzheimer's in the family or a parent is uh, dealing with it or has been diagnosed or possibly undiagnosed depending upon what your situation is. I want to cover a couple of things uh, with regards to the disease and then um, after, sorry about that. And then after, I'm going to reference Louise Hay, Louise L. Hay um, in her, the book that she wrote years and years ago. You can get this one still. Uh, it's called Heal Your Body, and this one um, is helps you connect the mental emotional connection to the dis-ease in the body. So dementia and Alzheimer's are both in here. So I will give the information with regards to that. I love Louise Hay. I love her stuff. I've taken, you know, some of her stuff online when she was still uh, in the physical. Uh, she transitioned. Um, I think she was in her 90s when she passed. Let me tell you a little bit about my story with Alzheimer's. Back in... I think it was 2008, in the earlier part of 2008, I got suckered into going to a family reunion uh, with my mom. Um, I I come from a very Jerry Springer family, so I, I, don't, I don't really do family stuff. It's just not my thing. Um, if you have ever read my book, Walking the Way, you would understand exactly why but uh mom she suckered me in and but I, I made a deal with her i told her that she would have to come and visit me uh, i was living in florida she was in new york and in upstate new york i told her that she would have to come and visit me if she wanted me to go and do the family reunion and then we could fly out to California together which is our original well my original home state and where most of her brothers and sisters are so she did she came down to Florida and stayed with me sometime before we got uh, packed up and ready to go on our journey out to California to the family reunion my mom uh told me that she was experiencing some memory issues and that it was starting to scare her. The red flag went up and I told her, all right, so let's get you in to see somebody when you get back from, from this trip and see if they can dial it in and figure out what exactly is going on with you. To figure out if it's Alzheimer's or if it's something else 
it could be more than just Alzheimer's or it could be Alzheimer's, whichever. But the important thing is to obtain a diagnosis so that you know what you're dealing with. So she agreed. We did the family reunion and came back and I never heard another bleep from her with regards to this. She didn't really want to talk about it. Later that year, I had made a purchase in Panama in Central America. And in then following a few months later in 2009, I actually moved to Panama, Central America. So again, the subject didn't come up and she didn't want to talk about it. If I did breach it, you know, broach that subject, she just didn't want to talk about it. Looking back on it, I should have or could have pressed it. Now, sometimes when you press the issue about getting diagnosed or talking to somebody in the professional realm about Alzheimer's, the person in question can get a little squirrely. It can cause them to get angry. It can cause them to get frustrated. Um, there are a lot of things that can happen uh, with regards to that. So don't expect things to always go easy when you do broach the subject or you do try to get them to get help. So there, there, there's a process that they're going through and it's not always easy to understand when you're the one looking from the outside looking in to them. Keep, just keep that in mind and lean on as much patience as you can possibly lean on. Um, while I was living in Panama, I had this book and I realized after a phone call to my mom one day where she referenced me, she started talking to me about me. And I was like, holy shit, here we go. This is the beginning. This is the real beginning. Actually, when she admitted to the issue that she was having, that really was the beginning, but I didn't, I didn't push it. So while I was living in Panama, I read, this, I read the book. And in this Jewel in the Condition uh, book, Sandy Collins Sparkman, she talks about referencing the condition is Alzheimer's, basically. And when they say the jewel, when she says the jewel, that's mom in the condition, that's the Alzheimer's. And that's how it was referenced within their family. And it just made it an easier way to describe what was happening uh, amongst themselves rather than, you know, it's like talking about cancer as the big C, you know. Alzheimer's is the condition or the big A. Cindy had actually channeled uh, her mom, um, you know, in the condition and or after the condition. And it's it was really, really interesting. I tried to tune into mom on many levels before uh, we came to the end stages of things. One of the biggest reasons why I wanted to bring this book up is because she had, Cindy had so much information in the back of the book on sources, resources, and who to go to to get help, how to get questions answered. And um, I am so happy that she did that. So I'm going to give you guys some information that helped me. When I came back into the United States, I regrouped and went straight up to New York uh, to help take care of my mom. Now she was married at the time, but as in most situations where it's a husband and a wife and one of them has Alzheimer's, the one that does not is exhausted from having to deal with the repetitive conversations, the repetitive memory loss, um, the wandering, the um, continually moving and hiding of things and um, all the things that come along with the disease. So it, it just depends upon what stage that they're in. When I got up there and pulled into my mom's, into my, at my mom's house, she welcomed me, but didn't really know who I was. And that, that was a really, really difficult, that was, that was difficult, but I knew, I knew it was coming. A lot of you are going to be going through the same things as I'm explaining now. And the reason I'm bringing this information forward, because I want you to understand that not just 
the person, your mother, father, or loved one, spouse, whatever, they're, yes, they are that person in the physical, yes, they are dealing with the, the, the fears and frustrations of the disease, um, but you are too. And not only are they dealing with that, but their soul is processing what's happening to them as well. They're there, their soul, their higher self is, is trying to get through this with the physical aspect. And um, it's, not, it's not easy on the physical side of things on a soul level. It, you know, it sometimes feels like you, you, you just wanna pat yourself on the head, you know, going through it. When I got into my mom's house, what would typically be a relatively organized kitchen and um, workspace, it, there was chaos amongst chaos in her kitchen. Um, my mother was a really good cook. I mean, not just, she did really good food and she came about it very naturally. So she had all these tools and things in the house, in the kitchen that she would use when she was cooking. Now, when I open the when I open drawers and cabinets, it's like a bomb went off in there. It was just a hot, stinking mess. Now, the kitchen is my mom's domain. Typically, with an, an Alzheimer's um, person, they have that they have that memory of they know this is their space, but they're not quite sure what that space is now. Uh, but they know that they don't want people in their space taking over, you know. And what did I do? But I came in and wanted to organize everything for first for safety reasons. And secondly, so I'd be able to cook and take care of things. Um, in this situation, my her husband, my stepdad was as about as useless as tits on a bull. And his answer to things was to just walk away. But you, you kind of can't do that with somebody who has a very highly progressed Alzheimer's, you have to pay attention to things. You have to pay attention to them in the kitchen where there are gas burners, um, where, uh, the, where there's an oven that they have access to, where there are things that they can trip over or cut themselves. Um, and you want to keep things as simple and tidy as possible so that it doesn't cause an accident or you know they so that they don't hurt themselves um you know pills and supplements and things need to be way up out of their reach um alcohol if there's an alcohol situation in that person's history get rid of it or hide it or whatever because you, a, a person on alzheimer's drunk not a good situation so there were a lot of things that had to be dealt with in there but what happens when you're dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's, they, they don't want their stuff disturbed. And I learned the hard way. So when I go in to clean, she, my mom, bless her heart, she would stand over me like she was gonna hit me. Um, get out of my kitchen. Get out, what are you doing? Get out of my kitchen. And that sort of thing. She didn't know that I was who I was. She didn't know I was her daughter. Well, I would have to make plans to have my stepdad take her out to lunch or take her for a long drive, you know, a couple of hours outside of the house so I could clean and or organize and get things a little bit safer. It was a huge learning experience for me. So I immediately got online and made contact with uh, the Alzheimer's Association. I reached out to them and said, what do I do? How do I help in the situation without causing problems, without causing um, a, a disturbance that is going to make my mom so uncomfortable? Um, so what they did is they gave me resources. They gave me place where there were meetings in my area. 
um, where I could go and talk to other people who were in the same situation. I highly recommend going to the Alzheimer's Association conference when it comes near you or in your town. It was a, a, a lot of information, a lot of educational value. It gave me tools to be able to learn what to do in certain situations. Um, my mom was a runner. She'd beat feet right out the back door and disappear. She would disappear. And they lived in the country, my mom and my stepdad. Um, and this can be a problem. A person takes off you know, outside who is already in a state of confusion, won't be able to find their way back, doesn't know how to you know, scream for help, um, is fearful, is angry, you know, all of those things. There are things you can do that I learned uh, from the Alzheimer's Association. They have bracelets that you can have your, um, your person wear. There are necklaces with um, a little uh, device. It's like a, a location device. There are ankle bracelets, and as bad as that seems, uh, it can be super helpful. So it, it, my mother would have just ripped it off, um, and that's just how she was in the stages she was in her ex the experience that she was having. She would never wear a necklace. She would never wear a bracelet. So those were not options in our case, but it might be an option for you in your case. So research that. You can go to alz.org, alz.org, um, or call their 800 number, 800-272-3900. That's 800-272-3900. That's the Alzheimer's Association helpline use it don't not use it it's there for a reason it can help you it helped me it helped me gain a better understanding of what to expect as the disease progressed in my situation i only lasted a couple of months um in that situation it, it, she basically you know kicked me out of the house she she was she didn't it, i was scaring her because not because I was doing anything in particular, I was just there. And so she thought I was a stranger. And, and that can happen and it can be the most terrifying experience for somebody who is in the throes of this uh, disease. It's, it's frightening to them. So um, I would tell you that, uh, you know, pay attention to all the little hints and clues that are happening. Big crows flying around out there for the last couple of days. Yeah. They must be having babies or something. Mm. You got it covered, Mom? It's all covered now? I got it covered. Okay. Were you wanting to put it in the refrigerator? Oh, you're going to put in a bowl. If it spills, it'll spill in the... Oh, well, that's pretty clever. And that's covered. And you put it way back there so it doesn't get in your way. Were you wanting to do something with that garbage can there? Where? The one that's sitting on top of the plastic wrap? No, it's been shooken out and I'm going to put a... Up, oh, another bag in it. Yeah. They were sitting right over there a little while ago. Does she want? Does your person um, have show signs of something they call sundowners, which is, you know, at the end of the day, they do a kind of a repetitive um, walk about their house, checking, opening cupboard doors or drawers and closing them back up, closing curtains, opening curtains, standing uh, in a weird or odd place in a situation and not knowing why they're there um, and just going back through and doing it again for hours 
this is like a wandering for hours and a shuffling of their feet in their steps not proper steps but almost a shuffling of their feet um, one of the things that i learned with regards to that is to make sure that the house is prepared for something like that make sure that there are not rugs they can trip over or be aware if there are steps in your house that they might trip on when they're um, doing or experiencing things like sundowners um, there are a lot of things there are a lot of um, information sources online you can google you can go to webmd.com uh, alzheimer's uh, association um, alz.org read as much as you can read talk to other people who are going through uh, the same situation i want to talk uh i covered the bracelet part um the bracelets something they can wear around their neck or something that they can wear around their ankles uh one of the main causes of confusion for an, an alzheimer's patient is um dehydration because they forget to drink they forget to hydrate their body they forget to drink and dehydration can cause crazy confusion um, it just makes a it's like putting fuel on a fire you know so it makes things really really bad so you want to make sure that you're always offering um water hey mom sip this hey mom taste this hey mom you know or whoever your person is um, get them to drink uh, water make it taste good put a little uh, juice in it if you if you have to put a little make it look pretty put some berries in there or um, cucumber or lemon or whatever to make it more palatable for them um, so dehydration can cause confusion making the Alzheimer's situation even worse it's like blow it up tenfold um, the other thing uh, to pay attention to is if things are going really crazy and they're acting really depressed or super angry and you know quickly out of the norm check uh, get them to the doctor and check for UTI UTI uh, urinary tract infection uh, can cause um, anger confusion depression all of these things so that is one of the most common um, problems, especially when you get in, get your person into an assisted living facility or a nursing home of some sort. Um, the caregivers there are always checking uh, patients for UTIs because it's it's very very common. Our hygiene isn't as typically good as what you would want it to be. See, the other thing about an Alzheimer's patient is they do not want to get in a bath and or shower. Uh-uh, no way, no how. As long as they're pretty clean down there, um, it's okay for them not to get in the shower. It's okay to take a sponge bath. It's okay if they haven't shampooed their hair in a little while. Now, when you're going months, that could be a problem and that happened to my mom she refused to get in the shower she refused to get in the bath she didn't want to wash her hair she didn't want to have any part of any of that it's normal it is not abnormal for a person to not want it with alzheimer's or dementia even uh, to not want to get into um, a bath or shower don't get upset about it don't get angry about it. Don't get frustrated about it. There are dry shampoos that you can use uh, for their hair. There are ways that you can um, put uh, maybe a little essential oil on a, a bath cloth, um, a washcloth with warm water and maybe just get their face a little bit or their under their arms a little bit, get their hands and maybe put a little lotion on their hands. If they'll allow you to touch them, that's really good. You know, let touch them, let them feel you, let them get cleaned up by that washcloth and just go as far as you can go. But don't get upset about it because it's not something that you're doing that is the problem. It's the state of being that they are in. Now, there are different stages of Alzheimer's um, and 
well, I'll just give you a little blip of each stage. So there's early stage, middle stage, and late stage. Um, in early stage, this is like the decision making time. This is a time while they still have a little bit of clarity, um, clear thought. This is the time to make sure the will is in order. <clears throat> this is the time to um, find out what treatments are available. This is the time to uh, educate yourself and reach out to support systems to find out about um, home care. Educate yourself. Knowledge is power. And you want to be able to give yourself a little bit of reprieve during the, during the experience. And if you educate yourself on what's going on and how to face things, learn how to face it, learn, learn what's really happening here that's the time to do it is in the early stages now the middle stages the biggest thing about the middle stages of alzheimer's is going to be communication they're not going to be able to put the thought to the mouth there's going to be a lot of repeating of things don't get mad about that it's not their fault it's one of the things that that was hardest for my stepdad because my mom would repeat herself a lot and he would get mad and he would slam doors and barrel out of the house or you know she would walk away and forget that she left the water running and it would freak him out or you know don't let these things trigger you take a breath take a moment. Certain things are just not important. It's not important that she left the water running. It's not important that, um, you know, she's got her shirt inside out or she's wearing, mom used to do this. She'd wear it because it was cold there. She, she would put on socks and st on her hands instead of gloves when we would go out for a walk. You know, okay. Is that comfortable, mom? yeah my hands are warm she would say my hands are warm and i'd be all, all right let's go let's go for our walk with your socks on your hands it's okay just go with it that's the thing you'll learn um, while dealing with this this really fascinating frustrating experience that there are certain things that are just not important socks on your hands are not going to kill anybody it's okay there are two words that i learned at that Alzheimer's Association conference that I went to in Albany, New York. Two words that I carry with me and I use in so many different situations. When you're dealing with an Alzheimer's person and they can't communicate and they're angry and they're frustrated and the story that they get out is that somebody's hurting them or this or that. They create this big drama. And the two words that I learned are, imagine that. Imagine that. It is neutral. You can't go anywhere with it. It's not an argument. It is not a, you know, dive into the drama. It is just a neutral statement that sort of diffuses the situation. It's a distract and move on in another direction. It is a, imagine that. Oh, look, mom, there's a dog outside. Let's go see it. Or, hey, is that a duck on that pond? What do you think that duck's doing? Whatever it takes, imagine that two very important words at the final in the late stages my by the time i got to my mom she was really in her late stages um so i learned about music and memory i learned about old photos i had put together photo albums from her childhood i didn't focus on the new stuff what was new to her not grandkids, not, um, you know, old new pictures of her brothers and sisters, the way they look now, but focusing on what it looked like when she was little, um, what it looked like, what her mom and dad looked like, pictures of her brothers and sisters and her when she was little. 
there weren't a lot. I didn't have a lot. So I made several different albums and put in big letters who it was in the photo and where it was. Mom would pretend to read books. Um, I knew she wasn't reading. I knew she couldn't read. But it felt she was a, an avid reader when she was able to. And so it felt comfortable to have a book in her hand. So with the photo albums, it was the same way. It was comfortable to have in her hand. And we would flip through the photos together. That's a really big deal. Brushing of the hair. And Alzheimer's patients really love this at times. Every person is going to be different. Every situation is going to be different. There is no right or wrong in it try things out and see what works for you my mother would not let me touch her hair she w didn't want me touching her hands she didn't want she didn't want anybody touching her um but she did want to go outside mom wanted to be outside so we went on walks and that's one of the big things with late stage people you know they 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 like the outside too in most cases that stimulation for their brain that it's the air that they can breathe they can smell or feel on their skin um, the coolness on their cheeks it gives them a runny nose or it makes their hands cold or hot or whatever the situation may be my mother used to like to uh, walk through the cemeteries it was just something she liked to do when she was before she got into that stage but it was typically a beautiful place uh the one that was near her big huge beautiful trees she liked to look at all the old dates and the old names of the the founding people of that particular area where she lived you're talking about touch with late stage they may or may not want you to do it try it if it doesn't work don't push it um, so it's touch, sound, music, and memory. Go back to the stage uh, where that person was young. Um, I used to do massage at, a, um, at an assisted living facility uh, three days a week. I did it for about five years almost there. And I used to play, if I did a morning session with them, I would always play the 50s and 60s blues and, um, blues and soul. The music that I would play for them in the morning would be Aretha Franklin, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Elvis Presley, uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, you know, those things from that era. I mean, they just absolutely loved it. We danced, we sang, they knew all the words. It was just one of those things. Now, I tried that with my mom and it worked a little bit and mom used to love to dance but um, she couldn't quite get there I, she was really far in her stages by the time I was there but I tried it and you know we did the best we could and, and that's really all you can do sweets typically Alzheimer's patients love sugar they love candy. They love sugary cereal. They love ice cream. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. They love it. My mom would, she would break into anything that was sweet and just chow down. And if you didn't watch her, she'd be up in the middle of the night doing that same thing. Um, it was just what they did. I re remember my, my grandmother would do the same thing. She would hide candy in her room. So always check the spaces. Uh, for for candy wrappers take take that person out for an ice cream they'll love it who can be mad when you're eating ice cream you just it's just one of those comfort yummy creamy things so expect expect that keep it simple go where they are in those late stages if they think that you are you know cousin Fifi from 40 years ago, then be that cousin. It's okay. Let them go there, go there with them. It doesn't matter. Certain things are important and certain things are not. Keep it simple. I want to make reference to the book that I talked about earlier, um, The Heal Your Body, what uh, Louise Hay wrote. In this book, she... Oh, yeah, and there's the bat. 
there's her pretty picture. This book is really beat up. I've used it a lot. So in the book, she created um, a list of the dis-ease in the body and then the mental emotional connection to that dis-ease and then the mantra um, to help shift the mood and or the energy of that dis-ease. So this is very Chinese medicine as well. There's a, an emotion connected to the organs that is connected to the issue with the organ. It's just, it's it's a crossover. Things are sometimes intertwined. So when I look up um, Alzheimer's disease, um, which is here at the top of the page, um, I look up Alzheimer's disease and it says, the mental emotional connection to the dis-ease, refusal to deal with the world as it is, hopelessness and helplessness and anger. And when you're dealing with an Alzheimer's patient, they can't get any more helpless or hopeless and frustrated and angry. They do have those stages, stages of anger. And, you know, God bless them. It's just, it's rough. So patience is really, really needed. Now the mantra for that, you're not going to get an Alzheimer's patient to sit there and repeat the mantra, but if you're hanging out with them and you want to say it out loud, there is always a new and better way for me to experience life. I forgive and release the past. I move into joy. Hey mom, let's move into joy. What do you say? It is another way to look at it. And you know, working, working on a soul level, on an energetic level with somebody who is dealing with that disease, I highly recommend going there. I, if you don't know how to do it, get with somebody, somebody like me who can help you understand the, lo the logistics of it. Um, somebody who understands the energetic aspect of what it is to deal with a person like this on a soul level. There are so many different ways to look at it and, um, and lean into what's happening with this loved one of yours. Please just try to go there, but try to go there with patience, as much patience as you can. There are a couple of different types of, um, three to be exact, uh, different types of Alzheimer's. Now there is a difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. Dementia is a, a natural um, decline in memory. It's organic. It's a natural decline in memory. Um, state of confusion can be, again, caused by dehydration and or uh, UTIs uh, with regards to dementia. Dementia versus Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is the actual brain disease. There is you, they, if they did a scan of the brain, you would show the breakdown in the brain because it is diseased. You would have to go on to um, alzheimers.org uh, or uh, they've got so many resources there so you can learn about that aspect of it. I, it's above my pay grade. Uh, I know the basics. I can give you the Charlie Brown version of things, but I, I just, you know, I don't know all the big words. So I try to keep it as simple as I can for me and hopefully for you. So yes, there is a difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's is the dis-ease and uh, dementia is the, the natural decline, the aging process. You know, when you go into a room and forgot where, what the hell you went into the room for. We all go through that. I'm well into my 50s and uh, slowly approaching 60. So, you know, I go through those things as well. Do I pay attention to it? Yes, because of my family's history with, uh, with that disease. There are three types of Alzheimer's. There's early onset uh, which is typically when you have somebody um, under 65 dealing with um, this severe memory loss and or you know state of confusion. This is rare according to 
was it Alzheimer's Association or WebMD that I got this? That um, I think it was Alzheimer's Association. Um, early onset is typically younger than 65, and it is on. It's more rare. Very, very few people uh, get the early onset. Late onset Alzheimer's is the next one, and that is for people typically 65 or over. Now, my mom was. can't remember how old she was when she do the math do the math I don't want to do the math anyway she was in her 60s um, when when she first told me that she was having she was scared that she was losing her memory um, so it totally that makes sense that really really makes sense um, and it progressed fast now some people it progresses slow my mother's Alzheimer's progressed fast the older she got the the more the disease took over um late onset they forget to drink they forget to eat they s slowly sometimes stop eating and drinking which causes a huge problem you want to make sure you get that person into uh, a care unit and start talking about ways to help better help them uh, and then the last one is uh, familial Alzheimer's. Now, WebMD says that it's linked to at least two generations when it's familial. And they say that it's um, that can start in like the 40s and 50s, that familial uh, Alzheimer's. Now, look, there was a really good movie. Um, that Julianne Moore did back in 2014. It's it's called uh, Still Alice, and she had the familial Alzheimer's. Um, and I think I think in that movie she was 50, um, and things she started having bladder control issues, memory loss, and in the movie I think she was a professor. So it was horrific for her to have of the to be such a controlled and educated woman and then lose it it had to be so scary and the way that it was portrayed in that movie was just phenomenal so if you're dealing with the situation like that highly recommend watching it it's called still alice and um that came out in 2014 we covered a, a little bit of the soul level, the soul aspect of um, what it is to have Alzheimer's. And one of the biggest things um, is in dealing with somebody that's got Alzheimer's is for the caregiver to get breaks. You are going to need breaks. You are going to need to get away from the situation for an afternoon, um, a day, a couple of days. Get care in for that person, a friend or a, somebody who can help take care of that person while you get away and regroup and breathe and care for yourself and have treats for yourself so that you don't go crazy listening to the repetitive conversation. You tend to lose patience when you have to deal with that. It's frustrating for yourself watching your loved one decline and watching that, you know, having to repeat and hearing the repetitiveness of what's coming out of that person who would typically have a, a, a beautiful and well-educated conversation with. Um, you need breaks. Knowledge is power. Learn as much as you can about how to deal with it and what to do, who to talk to. I can't tell you how many times um, I picked up the phone and called Alzheimer's Association. Uh, the number 800-272-3900. They'll give you local helplines and resources that you can reach out to. I, I went to meetings um, while my stepdad would watch my mom. I'd go to a meeting and talk to other people about what they were doing, how to put locks um, really high up on a door um, at the end of the day so that person can't get it in or out, how to put buzzers on the door so they can't get in or out. They can get in, but <laughs> they can't get out. So, you know, you can do things around the house without having to worry about them heading out the door and wandering. They will wander. 
and not for any particular reason um, that you could see, but somewhere in their process, they're looking for something. Or, you know, they've, they've clicked onto a memory that, you know, oh, I want to get flowers for my wife. Or, and out the door they head. No wallet, no ID, no nothing. Um, but off they go. Uh, again, like I said, my mom, she, would, she was a runner man she would take off and when she would take off and and i watched her really closely but she was sneaky if i would go upstairs i had to listen for that door to open and close and then i'd look out the window while i was upstairs and out she'd up the back field she'd be going um in the snow and the cold without a jacket because she was in a different place in her mind so it's <laughs> I have to run off, run downstairs, and off and head out, and with her jacket, and you know whatever, and do the walk with her. But you know there were a lot of dangers for her in that situation. Uh, I've been recently. I've been following a lot of uh, missing person cases on Adventures with Purpose. It's a really cool group of people who help solve cold cases and missing persons so somebody you know takes off in their car and never comes back for no apparent reason no id no none of their regular stuff it's not like they were running away from home they just got in their car and started driving and adventures with purpose uh helps to find people that are missing typically that have gone um, off the road into a, a pond or a river or a lake or whatever. They search bodies of water with sonar and things like that. They have solved so many cases. And what I'm noticing more and more is for their older people that have gone missing, it's typically not foul play. It's typically not suicide. It's typically Alzheimer's. It happens. And God bless them. You know, <laughs> it is hard to think of a parent or a loved one going through that you think oh my god their their struggle their plight it was horrific and fearful at the end maybe for a minute maybe for a minute but here's where my work comes in when i've connected with uh people on the other side um and actually having been on the other side myself and a near-death experience i can tell you firsthand once the once the soul leaves the body once you make that separation there's no fear there's no pain there's no struggle it is just a feeling that is hard to describe that is pure peace pure love such an golden beautiful feeling of embrace and a struggleless plightless fearless only love kind of feeling and i want you to have an understanding that if your parent has gone through this if your partner has gone through this if you've watched them at their end of days with the death rattle and the whole you know thing of the end of their life the end of their days that soul typically has already made that transition that start and so the feeling that you think they're feeling is not really that feeling the struggle has ended and the the new part of their journey has begun and it's really hard for us to understand because we have to hear them we have to see this happen we have to miss them if they've disappeared it's hard for us but not so much for them and i hope that if you don't take anything else away from what i've shared with you today that is one of the most important things that um the struggle is not there once the transition has been made or started it's quite beautiful actually um and 
I just, I want you to hold that in your heart when it comes to situations like this. All right. I spoke a lot about something that I didn't realize that I was going to speak about today. Uh, I, I came to, in the beginning of this, to try to do a review uh, of this book that no longer exists. And I'm so sorry that it doesn't exist. I mean, you could check eBay or, you know, old bookstores that carry old books. If I could say just a couple of things, remember, I don't even want to read from the book because I can't, you can't, you won't have access to it. So it's going to be pointless. You're going to have to get the information from new sources and from what I'm telling you here. Keep it simple. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of them uh, in this process. And understand and know that if your loved one has to go into a care facility, that the caregivers typically, there are some really beautiful souls who are just perfect in, in what they're doing. They're in the right business, for the right reasons, and please honor those caregivers because it is a damn hard job. Hard. Hard job. So show extra kindness to those people who are taking care of your loved ones um, in their last days, last months, sometimes last years, you know. Uh, And do everything that you can do until you can't. It's okay to ask for help. But again, I'm going to give you that uh, website one more time and the phone number one more time. Reach out. If you have questions, please leave a comment because I can help get you the information if you can't find it. Um, Alzheimer's.org. So it's A-L-Z dot O-R-G. Alzheimer's. I just Googled it when I was looking. So I Googled Alzheimer's Association. The phone number uh, that you can reach out to is 800-272-3900. 800-272-3900. They have resources that you can access if you don't have a computer and can't look that stuff up. Call. Um, They can get you the information that you need and phone numbers of people uh, to help get you better awareness and how to deal with things. That way you can know what your options are. Okay. So I don't know why they, you know, spirit has me going in this direction today with regard to this. Typically I'm, I'm doing a a read on something, but there's really something about the soul connection and taking care of your people while they're still here and whatever that soul relationship is between you and uh, your loved one, you you know, it's, it's time to maybe honor that. Um, just on a side note, if you, and especially if you have, are having a particularly hard time with uh, a loved one, um, and this dis-ease, I recommend getting with me and getting a soul chart done so you can understand the soul relationship between yourself and this person who is, this loved one who is dealing with the disease. Soul chart readings based on the Michael teachings really help give you a better understanding of why you came together with this person and, you know, what possibly your challenge is with them with regards to a soul relationship um and read 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 you know i love this heal your body this louise hay book louise l hay heal your body you can get it on hay house i think or amazon it has been around for a long time and it, it helps you better understand the mental causes for the physical illness and the metaphysical way to overcome them. So it's a way to shift the energy up with that disease or about that disease. Um, all right. I think that's it. I hope that you've enjoyed the information. If I had had this to watch before I went to try to take care of my mom, it might have been a little bit easier. I might have been a little bit easier on myself. It was very dramatic and crazy and painful. Um, 
and not for any other reason but that the disease took her ability to understand who I was. You know, I was her only daughter. Well, she had a stepdaughter and stepkids from her third marriage, but I was her only daughter by blood. And, you know, God bless her. She's still around. I still communicate with my mom. She's she's a little feisty. She was a feisty one on this side. She was not easy to deal with. I'm telling you. But um, on the other side, she is supportive and and loving and still feisty, but in a good way. You know, I'll never. I want to share this one more thing. Gosh, I don't know if I shared this before, but anyway, I'm talking about her. So I, in the way that she's supportive on the other side now, so that's so one of the one reasons why I want to bring it up. When I was at uh, Lilydale, um, that's it's a spiritual camp up in Lilydale in New York, and I was there uh, learning from Lisa Williams, and it was a mastering mediumship at the end of the course lisa williams gave her students uh, the ability to perform or demonstrate mediumship in front of an audience and typically in lilydale that would be at the stump they call it the stump it was a place where mediums gave demonstration uh, spirit messages years ago now it happened to be a windy day and that was prohibited on the day that we finished the course so we did it in the auditorium there were a lot of people there and so lisa asked the class who would like to be a, uh, uh, to demonstrate what you've learned and and you know try out your abilities um my hand went up and there were about six of us i guess that demonstrated on that day now listen what the hell was i thinking what the hell was I thinking? I just said, all right, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to take ownership of what it is I'm doing. And on my way, walking walking my way to the auditorium, I said in my mind, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? And I heard my mother all my peeps come in, my people, they come in on my left. And I heard my mother whisper in my ear, because that's just the kind of girl you are. And I laughed. I laughed because that is a term that I have used over the years to explain my sense of adventure. She knew that was exactly what I needed to hear. So off I went to the auditorium with the other students and a crowd full of people. We had five minutes to get on stage. Each person had five minutes to get on stage, introduce yourself and bring spirit in, give the information, the evidential based information, find your person in the audience who that spirit is connected with, boom, boom, and then be done and give thanks to the person and give thanks to spirit. And I did it. I can say I did it. And that is that is one of my favorite things to do to this day. I love private readings, but I really dig that platform mediumship. So if you ever get a chance to see demonstrations or to be a part of an audience where a medium is doing that, performing that uh, ability, uh, I say take it experience it watch it in real time as it's happening and you will experience laughter and you'll experience tears and just all kinds of emotions and ideas and thoughts and everything it's all going to come flooding forward and you're going to have a friggin awesome time and just as spirits having a good time the medium's having a good time and you're going to have a good time and it's so healing it's just really really a beautiful it's a beautiful beautiful thing so all right it's a long one today so sorry for that but um i just want to make sure that this information gets out there honoring uh what spirit guided me to talk about today so there you have it uh <clears throat> thank you for stopping by 
Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. I know it's long and drawn out, but there's a lot of information here. So hang on to it, rewatch it. You can always stay here on YouTube. Catch me on this channel uh, and rewatch these, revisit these um, uh, videos where they're they're going to help you and take notes so that you can you know jot down the little pieces of information that are going to help you get through what it is that you're getting going through with your loved one um thank you for coming god bless you many blessings to your loved ones going through this very thing um and remember self-care take the moments for yourself breathe you're going to get through it it's going to be fine your loved one's going to be fine it's okay it's okay all right i'll leave you with that visit me on my website mediumship by picasso visit me here on this youtube channel visit me on facebook um sometimes i do lives there as well so i look forward to uh hearing from you have a truly blessed day.